and we hear the words of the gospel from Luke. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms may be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them, and was carried up into the heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. I must stop and say it's good to be with you this morning as I begin. This was the church where I first came to my Christian faith after a long absence from it. It is also the church, and I'm going to move this a little bit so I can see you all too sometimes. I won't turn my back on you. And this is also the church where I was ordained. And uh, so there's many memories as I come back into this sanctuary. It is Ascension Sunday in the church calendar year. I have mental pictures from my childhood of Jesus and the disciples standing on a mountaintop with a booth of some kind and Jesus ascending into the heavens, recognizing that the resurrected Christ returning to the heavens does not fit our cosmological underpinnings as we know our world today. I'm not going to go there. Instead, we look to where the story is directing us. We know that the heavens are not out there, but in here, within the heart of our being. The author of the gospel is offering us a window into his understanding of the experience of the risen Christ. In this Ascension Day leave-taking, there is a gift and a blessing. Life has just thrown the disciples a curveball. Making sense of the happenings of the Easter story is hard. As we watch the disciples and their behaviors, it is easy to look or even wonder with judgment. There was so much confusion for them. We could easily judge the doubting Thomas the denying Peter, the betraying Judas, and yet there is a part of each one of us that has probably been that doubting Thomas, denying Peter, betraying Judas at some point in our lives or in our faith life. The journey of faith is a challenging one. If we take the tap on the shoulder from the risen Christ, seriously. The gospel says there is blessing in this leave-taking. Where is the blessing? I go back to words from my head, not my heart. No matter how a leave-taking happens, whether it is joyful or sorrowful, planned or unexpected, welcomed or resisted or grieved, 
it always brings an invitation to make space for the spirit to come. After a tragic or difficult death, like the crucifixion, it is easier to say these words from the head. Listening from the heart to the spirit's beckoning is another story. The risen Christ tells the disciples, I am sending upon you what my father promised. Stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Power from on high. I have danced with that power throughout my ministry, yearning for more connection, wanting to understand the deep desire for union that first brought me to Church of the Apostles and then on to Lancaster Sem Seminary and eventually ministry. I have spent time in Jesuit and Benedictine communities, in Quaker meeting, and in Boulder and Asian Buddhist communities, searching to understand that tap on the shoulder that happened in my life. Most recently, I have been studying with Father Richard Rohr, a Franciscan monk, and his colleagues, Reverend Cynthia Bergeau and Dr. James Finley, who was a monk with, uh, at Gethsemane with Thomas Merton, if you know Thomas Merton at all. Each who are master teachers of the wisdom tradition of Christianity. I have spent my ministry listening to hear the Spirit's promptings in the midst of my life, in the midst of our life. What if we listen in here, to the heavens in here, from the heart, from the inside out, what is being asked of us? Sometimes we don't want to know. In a world where there is so much divisiveness and need just to listen more empathically to one another, we need to listen hard. The poet Rumi in his writings speaks to this when we realize that the divine master is in time with us, in body with us, and burning away with us, our heart breaks open. Our heart breaks open and we have the opportunity to know the love that we are, the love that calls us into being and supports us on the journey, the love that seeks justice and peace and wholeness, not only for ourselves, but for everyone. Julian of Norwich, the 16th century mystic, offers us insight. It is both radical and simple. What if we were to understand that we are made of God? Not by God, not by a distant God out there who created us in a vacuum, but instead by a God of love who gave God's self away in us. What does it mean that we are made of God rather than by God? In part, it is to say that the wisdom of God is deep within us, deeper than our desire to do life our way, deeper than any ignorance of something we have done, deeper than any pain or hurt that we have experienced. To be made of God is to say that the creativity of God is at the core of our being. Deeper than the desire to orchestrate our lives, a clay pot, a beautiful manuscript, our painting, and most importantly, to say that we are made of God is to say that the love longings of God are at the very core of our being. The yearnings for oneness, justice, peace, wholeness that are deep within us are God's yearning through us, God's hurting with us, God's smiling with us. There is a God within us who is longing for union. We feel the tug at times, 
But the tragedy is that we live in exile from or in fear of this longing. We pack our lives with our own thoughts, our desires, our shoulds, or even judgment. So much so that we don't listen to this yearning. And we experience the desire and judgment and should in the disciples' behaviors in the gospel. But the risen Christ is asking the disciples to stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Actually, the disciples could use some good pastoral care. I teach pastoral care at Naropa University, a contemplative university in Boulder, Colorado, in my retirement, to MDiv students. One of the first premises that we teach is how do we help a person listen to the inner teacher, the voice of wisdom inside that can guide? How do they listen to the Spirit's promptings within themselves and within the person that they are with? Listening to the other person requires holding space. Holding space so that that person can listen to their own personal wisdom, the prompting of the Spirit. And finally, there is a rule of thumb, no fixing. We cannot do another person's journey for them. We can walk alongside of them. We can be with them in solidarity. We can feed them. For then we do not honor this, we do not honor the Spirit's prompting in their life if we take over their lives. We do honor the Spirit's prompting in their lives if we teach them what they need to know about good nutrition and how to live their lives in a way that is meaningful and meaning-making for them. Frederick, Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite authors, says, there is struggle but also truth as we experience ourselves and God's prompting within us. He says, when you find tears in your eyes, I, saw, I also, say nudge, also say nudges in your heart, especially unexpected tears are nudges. It is well to pay close attention. God is speaking to us through the mystery of those tears and those nudges, sometimes holding us, sometimes summoning us to where we might go next sometimes reminding us of the strength of whose we are. An experience in the beauty of a Japanese moss garden when we lived in Tokyo, Japan, and many others in ministry here in Lancaster and in Boulder and Denver, Colorado, have opened my heart space to the mystery of that God space in each one of us. I have traveled alongside many in the hospital as a chaplain and in the church where young and old alike will say, I think I'm spiritual but not religious. Something has happened to me. I want to understand the, that, that desire and yearning within me that wants more from life wants more from life than the just daily go to work, go to school, go to church, go to life, and come home. There is a search for meaning making in our world and what we are all about. There is a hunger. Many of the people that I have worked with want to make a difference in this world. They are committed to justice and peace and wholeness, not only for themselves, but for and with others. One of the things that they and I, that we are learning, is that to transform the world, we must first begin with ourselves. We must listen from the inside out to the Spirit's prompting within us. I have come here today I got teary the last service when I started this part. I have come here today 
to offer my gratitude to this community as you began and helped kickstart my journey, helping me to listen to those promptings. It was here in Lancaster at Church of the Apostles that I first needed to stay here in the city until there was clothing from on high. I needed, as well as my growing family, to find a home where we could come to understand what it meant to be in the body of Christ. In this congregation, I learned to begin to trust that I could go on this journey, first through the examples of people in this community. I was accepted with my questions. I did not have the answers, and at the time, I didn't want the beliefs. Now I do. Neighbors and others celebrated with us as we welcomed an unexpected third child into our well-intentioned family planning that went its own way. He was here in the early service with his two young girls. Youth and other youth leaders shared their questions and desire to be people of integrity and faith. We had fun together. We made mistakes together. We knew what it was to be community and to share fellowship. We wrote our own faith statements, and it was okay if they did not line up with someone else's. We were on journey together. Lead teachers gathered and committed themselves to caring for each other and the shared responsibility of one another's children. We got to know one another's children intimately. My oldest daughter, who I was so ready to send off to college, could rant and rave at her mother in confirmation. She sends her greetings. And there would be someone, her sponsor or someone else, to lend a loving hand. We could be wounded together, and it was okay. We had learned to trust. There are so many memories my husband making Foss nut donuts in the kitchen with all the women and other men, chicken corn soup, worship in motion, confirmation services, confirmation prayer retreats, my ordination service, which Don Freeman preached and then came to Boulder, Colorado and preached my installation service. And Bev Moran came along with him. The choir's anthem, how lovely are the messengers. Every time I hear it at another ordination, it brings me back to that day in 1981. Probably most of all, I remember a Memorial Sunday communion service where we named all of the people in the congregation who had passed. And all of a sudden, I felt as if they were all here in the sanctuary with us in this sacred space. But finally, it was time for me and our family to move on. I was a daughter of this congregation, and I knew that I needed to spread my wings. I had felt a nudge. Glenn Rader had walked me up the steps of Lancaster Seminary after his shaking his head a number of times suggesting that maybe seminary would help me answer my questions. He was humble enough to say that he couldn't answer them all. Don Freeman and Doug Whiting from the seminary had encouraged me to consider an MDiv rather than a Master's of Education. I had grown up in a church where women are still not even deacons or elders, much less ministers. To speak in church as an authority still can be a challenge for me. And I remember when I accepted the call to First Congregational UCC in Boulder, Colorado, Nevin Schellenberger said to me, somewhat confidentially, Nora, I don't understand those covenant people on the other side of the denomination. And I walked around the very 
the whole first year saying, what's your bottom line here? What's your bottom line? But I am back today to celebrate with you and express my gratitude for all that you have been for me as the body of Christ and all that you were for my family and all of the others who have had the privilege of growing and becoming more of the little Christ that Reverend Oliver Powell, a UCC minister, once shared in a sermon with us here in this congregation. And I say to you, as I offer my gratitude, a phrase I have learned while traveling and studying in the Asian world, namaste. Namaste, I honor the light in you, the Christ in you. Namaste, I honor the light in me, whom you helped birth. Namaste. Namaste.